Hello, it's a real pleasure to be here at TEDx Whitehall Women. Let me take you back in time. June the 19th, 1986, evening. I've just finished cricket practice. We've had a good session. Team are feeling good. It's our school team. We're all pretty excited about the grudge match we've got in a week's time against the rival school. Everyone's played well. We're feeling good. Walking home, the sun is just starting to go lower in the sky. As I walk, it's casting beautiful golden shards off the slate rooftops of the terraced houses I pass on my way home. I get home, and finally the sun sets, leaving a beautiful golden afterglow in the western sky. It's beautiful, it's brilliant, I'm happy. I go to bed, I go to sleep. I wake up the next morning, and I can't see. I've lost my sight overnight. It wasn't expected. It wasn't predicted. It certainly wasn't something I thought I'd have to face in my life, or even know anybody who would have to face that in theirs. But even in that first instant, that first moment of realization, I knew that it wasn't ever coming back. June the 19th, 1986. A beautiful sunset, a brilliant sunset. The last sunset I would ever see. How do you carry on? How do you continue after something like that's happened? Sport was a massive thing for me. I played cricket, rugby, football for the school. Did this mean that for me, sport, maybe even life, it was game over? No, because seeing isn't believing. Even at that moment of losing my sight, this huge rush of belief surged from inside me, saying, you are still alive. You still have possibilities. You will go on. You have to go on. You have no choice. But how to do it? I knew how to walk. I knew how to read. I knew how to write. I knew how to swim. I didn't know how to do any of those things, not being able to see. But I figured, even in those first few days, if I could get over the emotional pain, no easy task in itself, but if I could get over that emotional pain, then it was just practical problems which must, must, by their nature, have practical solutions. Practical solutions which I had to find. So how to go about it? Just going out the house, had to learn how to get about using a white stick to get around safely and to know where I was going. I had to learn to read, reading braille and books on tapes. I taught myself to touch type, to be able to write again on what was quite a modern device at the time, a laptop computer. I had to learn those skills and hundreds, hundreds more because I believed if I could get those practical solutions to the practical problems, maybe, just maybe, I could achieve the three dreams I'd had since being really little. To try and do A-levels, to try and get to Cambridge University, and most importantly, to try and represent Great Britain at sport. So I learned those practical skills. I found those practical solutions. Then, instantly, the first barriers put in front of me. I'm told, I can't go back to that comprehensive school. I have to go to a special school. 
I realize practical solutions won't be enough. I also need massive persuasion. I want to go back to that school. I have to go back to that school. That's where all my mates are. That's where my teachers are. It's down the road. I'm going to go back to that school. Three months later, I am indeed back at that school. Three months later, I'm back in the swimming pool. And again, I can swim, but I have no experience of swimming blind. I have to learn how to do it again, to develop a balanced arm stroke so I swim straight and don't zigzag up and down the pool, to stroke count, to know exactly where to put the turns in. Admittedly, in some of those early sessions, I knew when to turn when I got this sudden sharp pain in my head <laughs> and I realized that must be the end of the pool. <laughs> Fortunately, I developed out of that, but relearning how to swim, a completely familiar environment in a completely different context. I went to City of Birmingham Swimming Club because I believed if I was going to try and get somewhere in this sport, I should do the same, same sessions that the Olympic swimmers were doing up there. It wasn't the best facilities. It was a 25-yard pool. The roof was held up with scaffolding. It was Victorian. It was crumbling. It was in one of the roughest parts of Birmingham. But look to resourcefulness rather than resources because we had the coach who we believed in. We had a program we believed in and we believed in each other as teammates that we could do something special, even though on the surface of it, it was resource poor. The one measure I put for everything I was doing at that time, will it make me swim faster? Obviously in the training sessions, but also diet, sleep, rest, leisure, every single thing in my life had to pass that test. Will it make me swim faster? If it won't, why would I do it? I think that's a great key for all of us. Work out what your will it is, and it will enable you to more than will it to happen. From that 25-yard pool, roof held up with scaffolding, we got five people to the Olympic Games and four people to the Paralympic Games, of which I was lucky enough to be one. Four Paralympic Games under my belt, lucky enough to stand on the medal rostrum at every Games. Unfortunately, sometime after winning my last gold medal, I discovered that the silver medals are actually worth more than the gold medals. <laughs> my whole swimming career, a financial disaster. <laughs> I should have had much more tactical second places. But for all those podium finishes, one moment in time equal to all of them, and that was getting involved with London 2012, the bid to potentially bring the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games back to London for the first time in 64 years. Could we do it? Imagine the small bid team we had, starting 10, 15, 20, up to 50 of us, believing that maybe, just maybe, if we commit, if we focus, if we believe, maybe we can just pip Paris to the winning post. Maybe. This is all in a context of a sceptical public and an almost totally negative press. Now, I know the concept of a negative British press is difficult to understand. <laughs> Work with me. <laughs> this is the context, and yet this small, tight team believed if we stuck to our mission, our vision, if we put athletes at the heart of every decision, maybe, just maybe, we could bring the games back to Britain in 2012. July the 6th, 2005, surely the longest envelope opening in history. And we hear that word, London. And we know the Games is coming back. But that is just the beginning of the journey, a seven-year journey. 
If we've been focused, if we've believed you're in the bid, we need that in spades for the seven years that are to come. To have everybody on the team focusing on exactly what we said at the beginning of the bid. To put athletes at the heart of every decision. Back to that, will it? Will it improve the experience for athletes? Will it enable athletes to have to focus on only one thing, doing the performance of their life in London 2012? If it won't, why would we do it? To have that at the heart of what we are doing, to have diversity and inclusion hardwired into every decision, and to use the games to inspire young people all around the world to choose sport. That was the bid. That was the beginning of our seven-year journey in planning the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We had seven years. From that first day, we still had to instill in everybody the sense of pace. Every day, every minute had to matter. We had the most immovable of deadlines. Nobody was going to say to us, wasn't the London Olympic and Paralympic Games sensational in 2013. We had the most immovable of deadlines. We measured it out in Tuesday mornings. We said to our staff, there are 300 Tuesday mornings to go, and we counted down like that. For the public who we had to get on board, we measured in years to go, in days to go, to build their belief in the project, their commitment, and their excitement to get involved and have no option than to want to be part of it. Focus, pace, and building a winning mentality in the team. We said to everybody, we need you. There's no alternative. We need you to do the best work of your life. We need world-class performance to equal the world-class performance that the athletes will be doing in 2012. Nothing short of that. If we needed focus, pace, and a winning mentality for the Olympic Games, we needed it a thousandfold for the Paralympic Games. I had a vision, I had a belief that we could do something incredibly special with the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. Stars aligned, but it wouldn't just happen. Everybody had to believe that alongside me. But look at the history. When Moscow won the right to stage the Olympic Games in 1980, they wrote to the International Coordinating Committee and said, we'd love to stage the Paralympic Games. Unfortunately, we're unable to because we don't have any disabled people in Russia. <laughs> this is not that long ago. I looked to history again. I saw that no previous Paralympic Games had sold out or got anywhere near a sellout. And yet I knew if we were going to make this a game changer, we had to sell out. We had no choice. We had to get all Olympic sponsors, also Paralympic sponsors, never been done before. And we had to drive broadcast deals right around the world. Never been done before, never been done before, never been done before. But that is what I knew we had to do to make London 2012 Paralympic Games a game changer. I based everything in research. That didn't help me, or it did, because it told me I was looking at a sellout. Zero percent of people were prepared to say they were strongly likely to buy a ticket to come to the Paralympic Games. Zero percent of people, and I want to sell out. What to do? how to do it. I had to convince 8,000 full-time members of staff, 70,000 volunteers, over 100,000 contractors, convince them to share my belief, to share the possibility of the Paralympics. More than that, though, I had to convince 2.8 million people to buy a ticket to come to the Games. Wider still, I had to convince hundreds of millions of people to tune in to watch the Paralympic Games across the UK on television and right around the world for the first time. Difficult, difficult, difficult. Put in the Paralympic Games. Put in the concept of disability and all the issues around there. Tricky stuff. How to go about it? To look at all the images, to create a file 
of every image of a Paralympian that's ever been taken to analyze, to run through them, and to create a library file of images which everybody would commit to using and no other images. Images which would say grit, determination, elite sport, courage, get stuck in, blood, sweat, tears. All the images which we know about sport, none of the images could even hint at care, concern, sympathy, or an atavistic response to disability. Get that file right, get everybody to use those images across our sponsors, across the broadcasters, across the press, to get that picture of what we wanted the games to look like. But we needed, alongside that, a massive moment. I thought, let's have International Paralympic Day in Trafalgar Square at a, hundred, a, a, a year to go. Never been done before. Get the 20 Paralympic sports all showcased in Trafalgar Square in front of the world's media, and at the centre of it, have Prime Minister David Cameron against Mayor of London Boris Johnson in a game of wheelchair tennis. <laughs> I'll leave it for you to consider and discuss in the break who won the tennis. <laughs> it's a good debating point. Reason for doing that, get the world's media snapping, broadcasting those images. Picture of the day in The Guardian, picture of the day in The Wall Street Journal the next day, broadcast around the world, then putting Paralympic tickets on sale, and in the first two weeks, shifting 1.1 million tickets for the Paralympic Games. That gave people even more belief. For people who were doubting at that point, a year to go, they then came on board and saw that, yes, yes, we can sell this thing out. It is going to be different in London in 2012. So to the games itself. 11 days of sensational sport. Yes, the swimming pool was excellent. Of course I'm going to tell you that. And of course it's true. But the athletic stadium, the velodrome, superb, and all sessions sold out. More than that, though, sports that people had never even heard of before the games, never mind seen, also sold out. Wheelchair rugby, the Canadians call it murder ball. <laughs> These guys mean business. They don't just have a physio on the bench, they have a welder. <laughs> this is Paralympic sport at the sharp end. 11 days of sensational sport to change attitudes, to increase opportunities, to change the way people perceive and to demonstrate what you can do when you get momentum behind an idea, behind a concept and convince 8,000 full-time, 70,000 volunteer and 100,000 contractors to share that belief and be part of it. London 2012 Paralympic Games demonstrated how we need to move from seeing to being a games made in Britain representing a modern, diverse Britain, but crucially, a games built on the bedrock of unshakable belief. To turn to a great believer, Mr. William Shakespeare, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Underlings be gone. Let belief blast us into the characters we can be, not the caricatures of our own or someone else's scared scheme. I've been extraordinarily lucky to get to Cambridge University from a failing comprehensive, to get to the medal rostrum at four Paralympic Games from a dilapidated swimming pool in Birmingham, to lead the team that planned and delivered a London 2012 Paralympic Games. All of these experiences out of sight. Ladies and gentlemen, seeing isn't believing. It's belief. Belief that brings forth the vision. Thank you very much.